Welcome to today's GNCC Espresso Live with our distinguished guest, the Acting Medical Officer of Health for the Niagara Region, Dr. Herji. Dr. Herji, thank you so very much for being with us. And to all of our participants, I'm glad that you are able to join us this morning. My name is Mishka Balsam, and I will be your moderator for the next hour. While organizations and governments are responding to the ever-changing pandemic impact, business at the same time have questions, and we're privileged to have Dr. Herji agree to join GNCC's Espresso Live on a monthly basis, especially in these critical times. Earlier this week, the federal government advised Canadians against international and non-essential travel. During the same announcement, we learned that the Public Health Agency of Canada will ramp up the mandatory arrival testing program at airports. On that same day, the provincial government announced that it's rapidly accelerating its booster dose rollout by expanding eligibility to individuals aged 18 and over and starting the program as early as Monday. In addition, it introduced 50% of capacity limits on many venues and facilities with the usual capacity of 1,000 or more. And as part of the enhanced testing strategy, the Ontario government announced making 2 million rapid antigen tests available across the province. The same week, a day prior to it, the province announced new measures at long-term care and retirement homes. And at the same time, we're looking at new modeling from the Ontario COVID-19 science table that warns that the province could see 10,000 cases a day or more in just days as the Omicron variant of the coronavirus takes over. These are just some of the headlines and news that we as a business community and we as individuals have faced over the last three or four days. With that in mind, I thank each and every one of you for being with us this morning to get actually a better understanding from Dr. Herdy on our current situation, especially here in Niagara, and what to expect and how to prepare for it. Often in advance of our espresso, you, our audience, provide us with questions. And this week, in light of all the announcements that have taken place this week, that your questions have come in at a record high number, and we are committed to getting to all of them. For those of you who are new to the espresso format, what we normally do is that Dr. Herji will give us an update for about 30 minutes and then the last half hour of it, we'll be able to address all of your questions that you have. If you wish to enable live transcript, please refer to the bottom of your Zoom screen for that option. And on that note, uh, I'm going to pass this webinar for the next half hour over to Dr. Herji or however long your uptake will take. Thank you for being with us. Hey, thank you so much, Mishka. And I think you've uh, laid out the unfortunate situation that we are in right now, where things are all of a sudden looking, unfortunately, much worse than we hoped they would be. Um, I will try and maybe stay a little shorter today so we have a little bit more time with questions because it sounds like there's quite a few questions. And, you know, I, I think I'll start off by just kind of setting the stage of what the Omicron variant is. And you know, I think we first learned that the Omicron variant was in South Africa just actually only three weeks ago, so it has not been very long. And this is through the pandemic what South Africa's case curve has looked like, you know, went through three waves not too dissimilar than us. And then early in, you know, December, late November, they started to see their cases go up and identify the Omicron variant at that time. And as you can see, this is what has happened since then, and they are now reaching new heights of cases. And what I think is significant is that, you know, if you look at any other wave, there's sort of a slow buildup of cases and then it slowly accelerates. What you he see here is that this is very quick acceleration where very quickly you're seeing the numbers go up pretty much almost vertically. We take a look at some of our, you know, European neighbors who've also been affected by the Omicron variant. This is Norway and you can see similarly, they, saw, they were actually seeing their cases go up for a while but it has actually started to become a bit steeper. You can almost make out here where the angle has changed and it's become a little bit steeper. Uh, taking a look at uh, Denmark here, you can kind of see the same thing where they actually were seeing their cases go up and then they've seen this sharp increase. Um, just want to quickly show you here that where Ontario is relative to Denmark and Norway was just a little bit under where Denmark is. So we have actually done a lot better here in Ontario than some of the European countries, which hopefully will set us up a little bit better to manage the coming wave. And then I just want to highlight here the Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox and Addington area of Ontario. This is the area that was first hit with the Omicron variant here in Ontario. 
And you can kind of see a similar pattern here where, you know, they've had previous waves, but now they're seeing this very sharp increase in cases due to the Omicron variant. And I think, unfortunately, that seems to be the nature of this variant, that it spreads very, very quickly. And so once it takes hold, you start to see these really astronomical increases in cases. Here in Niagara, you've probably noticed that our cases have been going up lately. And you know, I think you can kind of see that there's the increase and then it's sharpened. And that almost certainly is, we are starting to see the spread of the Omicron variant here as well. Uh, and if you take a look at the Ontario case curve, very similar, you're starting to see that sharp uptake for them as well. Now, I don't know if people were paying attention to what Ontario announced only just about 30 minutes ago in terms of their case number. So a couple of days ago, there were about a 1,600 or 1,800 cases. Yesterday, they jumped up to 2,400 cases. And then today, they're actually at 3,100 cases. So that can give you a sense of how quickly it's rising. What I show you here is actually an average number over the course of seven days, which smooths out the line and gives you a bit of a cleaner pattern. But that also means this point here is an average of the past seven days rather than showing exactly what happened today. And so I just want to quickly show you, uh, you know, how steep this line is. So if we take a look at our third wave there, that's how steep that increase was. If I draw that same line here, you can kind of see that the increase now is deviating from that red line and it's going to be steeper. And if I, you know, take out the averaging of cases to just show exactly what the number was every day, you can even get a better sense of how much over the last few days the cases have started to increase here. This is some data put out by the science table where they actually break out the Omicron variant cases versus all of the other cases that aren't the Omicron variant, largely uh, Delta variant. And you can kind of see the pattern of Omicron variant, which is of course superimposed on what we're seeing with our other cases. And you know you can see here that we are up to 80 cases per million with the Omicron variant. And this was a couple of days ago, which is actually already higher than what we are seeing for the Delta variant. And so the Omicron variant has very quickly become the majority of cases in the province. And increasingly, that's going to mean that the pattern we're seeing here is going to dominate over the pattern that we're seeing with the Delta variant. And this is just another way of showing it where the orange line here is a Delta variant. This is a percentage of our total cases. So you can see as a percent of our cases, the Delta variant is now under 50%. And the blue area representing the Omicron variant is now you know, displacing it, basically. You know, I've often talked about the reproductive number. And the effect of reproductive number is basically the metric that says for every case of COVID-19, how many additional people are going to, or how many people are going to be infected by that one person. So if that number is one, that basically means that for every person who's infected, they're gonna spread it on to one person and you will basically see a flat number of cases because it's not gonna grow. When it's below one, that means each person is passing on to fewer people, so you're gonna see a decline in cases. If you're above one, you're gonna see an increase in cases because each person is gonna spread on to more than one person, it's gonna grow over time. And this is sort of what that reproductive number has looked over time. You can see here in December, January, when you're going to our first, uh, our second wave, sorry, of course, there's above one. Our third wave was above one. We went through a relatively small fourth wave in August, and that's what this represents. And you can see after that, we always got our cases down a bit and the reproductive number was down. And you can see, you know, we've always kind of been in this one to 1.3 range, maybe going up a little bit to 1.5 briefly here, but that's kind of been the ballpark in which we have always seen our reproductive number in the province. Right now, if you look at our overall reproductive number in the province, we're still around that 1.3, 1.4 range, so the upper end of that. But when you break it out into the Omicron variant versus the Delta variant, the Omicron variant is actually upwards of four in terms of its reproductive number. And so on average, we're seeing each person pass infection on to 1.3 people, but each person who's infected with the Omicron variant is passing on to four to four and a half people on average. And so, you know, instead of seeing each generation growing by about 30%, you're seeing each generation growing by about 350% now. And so that is a very marked increase in the spread of the infection. And I just want to show you what this means here. So, you know, if we have a reproductive number of 1.3 with, say, the Delta variant and a reproductive number of, say, 4.5 with the Omicron variant, 
With the Delta variant, you would see, say, an increase like this over the course of six days. And you can see, you know, it's hard to even make out that this is an increase. It's a little bit increase if you could, you know, compare that side to that side. But if you look at the Omicron variant, if it has a reproductive number that high, you're going to see an increase. It's going to look like that. And that's why you see that really sharp increase. It's because the Omicron variant is so efficiently spreading to other people. And that's going to allow this, basically the case trend to really deviate from what we've seen before. And this is what the science table put out yesterday, basically trying to model where things are going. And so this is you know, where cases have been over the last little while. And there's some uncertainty, of course, of what we're going to see. But this blue uh, red area, sorry, is going to be the range of where our cases will end up. And so today I mentioned that we are on the order of about 3,100. So we're perhaps around there for December 17th. So kind of tracking in the middle of what this red range looks like. And so if we are tracking in the middle, you can imagine that by December 25th, we could be over 5,000 cases. Uh, we've never been over 5,000 cases before. I think this dotted line here is, represents the maximum we've previously had in Ontario. And so, you know, we're probably a week out from setting all time highs in terms of the number of cases we have. And so this Omicron variant is really kind of the unprecedented storm. I think nobody imagined that would happen. And I just want to quickly compare it to the other variants that we've had over time. So we started off with the variant at a, a basic reproductive number. So if you're doing nothing to control it, there's no immunity in the population. You know, the reproductive number was 2.4. We probably had a pretty good vaccine efficacy at that time, which meant that, you know, we didn't have to get too many people vaccinated to get the herd immunity, which would have wiped out the virus. Uh, and a variant emerged last March as the virus was spreading through Europe, and that's actually what we got here in Canada, which was a little bit more difficult to control. We, of course, had the alpha variant at the start of this year, which spread a little bit more easily, but our vaccine remained, you know, pretty effective against it. The Delta variant, even more difficult to control, but we continue to have a good vaccine to prevent it. What we see with the Omicron variant is that you have this massive change now and that, that basic reproductive number is probably on the words of over 20. It's you know, not just an incremental increase, it's you know, three times more infectious. And unfortunately, it has come with our vaccine also becoming less effective as a result. Now, I'll talk a little bit later that actually with the booster dose, this starts to actually get it back up to, you know, the kinds of numbers we saw with the Delta variant. But this is, I think, the other big challenge that we're facing with this variant. And because the vaccine isn't as effective and because it spread so easily, the herd immunity is really not even theoretically possible, though I think we were already at a stage where practically we were not going to get to herd immunity. Now, I think an important thing to realize is that we're talking here about how high cases are going to go. Ultimately, what matters is going to be how many people are going to be severely ill. I think we've had a strategy in Ontario where we've tried to keep cases down. If you keep cases down, the percentage of people who are going to be severely ill is going to stay down. That's not going to be a large number as a result. And therefore, we're not going to see a lot of people becoming severely ill. And I think we're probably headed into a strategy where that is no longer going to work. We're not going to be able to control the cases given how quickly the Omicron variant spreads. And so it's going to be really important now that we find a way to limit the severe illness that we are going to see going forward. Now, you know, just stepping back, I showed you this graph that you know, the Omicron variant is going to you know, rapidly rise in terms of its cases. And the Delta variant, of course, is going to not rise as much. So the Omicron variant is going to lead to a much higher growth of cases. If we assume that the Delta variant and the Omicron variant are going to be equally severe, you can imagine that you're going to end up with kind of a similar pattern here, where this is how hospitalizations would rise with the Delta variant. And this is how high hospitalizations would rise with the Omicron variant, assuming this was equally severe to the Delta variant. There is some talk that maybe the Omicron variant isn't as severe. Maybe it's only about 75% as severe. But given how much more infectious the Omicron variant is, even with that reduction in severity, we would still see an increase in hospitalizations. Yeah, we would start out maybe being a little bit lower, but very quickly, just given how high cases are, it is going to catch up in terms of the hospitalizations, and we're going to see that increase. Maybe not as much as we would quickly as you'd see it increase if 
the Omicron variant is equally as severe as the Delta variant, but it's still going to rise. And I think if we take, you know, an even, you know, unrealistic scenario here, then, uh, you know, this is just spreading this out over a couple of weeks now. And if we take, let's say, an unrealistic scenario where, let's say the Omicron variant turns out to be super mild. It's only about 10% as severe as the Delta variant. Over the course of two weeks, you might have seen hospitalizations increase like this with the Delta variant. Hospitalizations of the Omicron variant would increase like this. So yeah, we would start off with you know uh, far fewer hospitalizations for a period of time, but eventually, because the cases are rising so quickly, even that smaller percentage of becoming severely ill would eventually catch up to what we'd see with the Delta variant, and we would start to see the increases in hospitalizations. And so I think the important thing here is that we can't hope that just because the Omicron variant may turn out to be less severe is going to save us from seeing a big spike in hospitalizations. Unfortunately, just given how high cases are going to rise, the percentage of people, even if it's smaller, who are becoming hospitalized, is still going to end up being a very large number because the number of cases are going to be quite large. And if we're looking at other jurisdictions, this is from the Ontario Science Table yesterday, they highlight that in uh, Gauteng, South Africa, uh, they have seen their uh, this dark line is hospitalizations, the orange lines, people in ICUs, these are ventilation in people on oxygen. All those numbers are unfortunately rising in uh, Gauteng, South Africa, with their increase of cases of the Omicron variant. And so we aren't going to avoid an increase in hospitalizations here based on their experience. Uh, you can likewise see, you know, even deaths, sadly, have increased there. In South Africa, it's interesting to see here just you know, this uh, purple line here was the increase of cases in the first wave, the blue line increases in the second wave, yellow line increases in the third wave. And you can see this new Omicron wave, how much faster the cases are rising. And that's being paired with this fast rising hospitalizations, showing again, unfortunately, that the cases aren't gonna be decoupled from an increase in hospitalizations. Sadly, the hospitalizations are going to follow. Unfortunately, it looks like the deaths so far there are not increasing. And so perhaps there is some, you know, luck we may have there. And perhaps it turns out to be still causing the hospitalizations, but perhaps ultimately less deadly. This is data in Denmark showing again that as their cases have gone up, which is the orange line, they are seeing their hospital occupancy going up. And if they're looking at hospitalizations by Omicron variant to the Delta variant and other strains, unfortunately, it's, you know, in a similar ballpark. And so the Ontario Science Table is sort of modeling this is what they can expect. This red area is where ICU admissions are going to go up. And if we are tracking in sort of the middle of for cases where maybe you're going to be in the middle for hospitalizations. So looking at getting into the three to 400 people in ICU beds by the end of the month. Um, even if it's less severe, they show uh, here, you'll probably be, you know, say if you take the middle of the pack, three to 350 people in the ICU beds by the end of the month. If we take a look at what we've seen this far in the pandemic, so this orange line here is what our ICU beds have done. We peaked in the sort of 800, 900, I think, ICU beds in the third wave. We're fortunately down close to about 150 now, so that we could see increasing to three to 400 by the end of the month and unfortunately still be on upwards table. But we've managed to have absorbed 900 uh, ICU beds in the past. So this does give us some hope that because we have kept our cases low in Ontario for the most part, we've kept our ICU beds uh, relatively free. We do have a little bit of time where we are going to be able to absorb the increase of cases and hospitalizations. And we'll be able to do something during that time to hopefully mitigate this increasing further. And that's what I really want to talk about is that there are, I think, several tools that we are going to have available for us to mitigate this spike in hospitalizations and severe illness. And the first one is, of course, going to be the vaccine. So I mentioned that the vaccine looks like with fully vaccinated people, it's less likely to prevent illness. The good news is that with a booster dose, we're seeing that it is actually increasing immunity back up to something like 75%. So a really substantial increase in immunity. And so for people who are older, who are more likely to be severely ill, more likely to be hospitalized, if we can get them booster doses, that is, of course, going to hopefully prevent them from being infected. 
Another important detail about the vaccine is that when we look at preventing severe illness, fortunately, actually, even with just two doses, it remains really effective at preventing severe illness, 70% effective at preventing severe illness. And we don't yet know what a booster dose is going to be doing, but if a booster dose is increasing immunity quite a bit, our hope is that by increasing, giving a booster dose to the people who are most vulnerable, we could actually get their pr uh, protection to severe illness up into maybe even to the 90% or above, closer to the 95% that we've seen with protection against Delta variant. And so the vaccine, I think, is going to be really important. We have a high vaccine uptake here in Ontario, higher than a lot of the other countries I've shown. So that is, a, you know, right off the bat, going to make sure we have a lot of people who are going to be prevented from severe illness. And with getting booster doses to those most vulnerable, we'll hopefully prevent infection in them so they can't get severely ill. And if they do still get ill, we'll hopefully have a much higher uh, protection from severe illness for them. And so that's going to really tamp down, I think, the risk in a, going for them going forward. So that, I think, is going to be one really important tool for us. Another tool, which I think the science table highlights here, is that increasing vaccination, unfortunately, will not be enough to slow this wave, just given how fast it's coming. And they talk about here circuit breakers with additional public health measures to reduce people's social contacts. And you know, if we showed this graph before, they had this green range here, which is if we take measures to reduce people's social contacts, there is an opportunity to actually flatten out this curve and avoid the huge increase that we're going to see. Some of that, I think, is going to be personal behaviors. And I think heading into the holiday season, a time when we are normally going to socialize a lot, unfortunately, I think it's going to be a season this year where, again, we need to curtail those gatherings and spending time with others so that we can try and get onto this other trajectory. I think the other thing that, of course, the science table is talking about is the need that we are probably going to have to bring in some capacity limits and restrictions in public spaces to limit the interaction of people out in public, to hopefully curtail those contacts and get us on this kind of flattening out trajectory. And if we flatten out that trajectory, that, of course, means your people are getting sick, your people are being hospitalized. We're going to have a much longer lead time to actually get vaccine booster doses out to people and be able to then rely once again on the vaccine to support us getting through here. Uh, you know, as they highlight here in the science table is one of their conclusion, those circuit breaker measures that cut contacts plus, you know, accelerated booster doses for the most vulnerable is going to be really key. We need to, though, act promptly to do this. And the other part here is, of course, in all of the personal behaviors we want to make sure we keep doing. Wearing high quality masks that fit us well so the air can't escape from them or get into them around them. We want to make sure we continue to have physical distance, avoid places where there's crowds, increase ventilation, and you know, start using rapid tests more. And I you know, suggest that even with you know, rapid tests now becoming freely available to the public, something that we will be able to do is use those maybe if we do have a holiday gathering to test everybody before they come and make sure that we're not actually seeing someone infected hopefully coming into those gatherings. And you know, all of these measures are going to be imperfect, but I think if we do all of them, we are going to be able to slow and actually prevent a huge wave of the Omicron variant similar to what other countries have seen. You know, avoiding large gatherings, continue to have physical distance, staying outdoors or keeping our indoor spaces well ventilated, wearing masks indoors, making sure we have that vaccine and the booster dose. You know, this is kind of what's called the Swiss cheese model, where you recognize that there are holes in each one of these. None of these is perfect. But when you add all of them together, that actually means that the holes aren't necessarily going to align. And together, you're actually going to be able to protect yourself. And adding on to these, you know, one other big tool we have is we're now seeing new medications come out that can treat COVID-19. So the people who do get severely ill, who are unfortunately hospitalized, they're going to have a much higher risk uh, chance of survival thanks to these medications. And even vulnerable people who get sick with COVID-19 will be able to treat them with these medications and prevent them from becoming hospitalized. And, you know, thinking about your workplace and how we can apply some of these measures, I just want to emphasize again, you know, Making sure you have a vaccination policy in workplace, getting high vaccine rates up, that's of course going to keep your staff safe and keep your customers safe. Screening at people daily to make sure they don't have symptoms and adding rapid antigen tests is another step of that screening to identify if you have cases coming into the workplace so you can keep them out of the workplace. That's a great step to keep the workplace safe. 
making sure you have sick policy so people who are sick feel supported to stay home that they're not going to lose their income and that way they're able to stay isolated they're able to get tested and we're able to make sure we don't have infections coming into the workplace you know making sure we enable people to keep physical distance on the job and especially inside vehicles where of course there's not a lot of room having people ideally traveling alone continue to have masks worn inside the workplace wearing eye protection where people have to work in close order that's of course going to be really important again making sure breaks break rooms the places where people are going to have a coffee eat a meal that's of course where you drop your mask you let your guard down so trying to minimize use of those rooms space people out really well in those rooms to reduce the risk and making sure you maximize the ventilation in your workplace if you have areas that are poorly ventilated bring in a HEPA filter so you can remove virus that might be floating in the air all of these are things that I think we're able to do to make sure our workplace stays safe. And of course, as a provincial requirement to have a workplace safety plan. So that'll, of course, help you to think through some of these steps. I think that's going to be a really important step for us to be taking as we move forward. Last thing I'd want to do is just quickly talk about vaccination. You know, I've talked in previously how our young people are at greatest risk of uh, getting COVID-19 right now. And we have fortunately had some good progress with young people. We have over three quarters of teenagers now fully vaccinated. Another 4% of them have at least one dose. And so we're making progress on getting this to be another group who's going to be protected. And of course, if they are protected, they're less likely to get ill. They're less likely to protect a press infection onto older people who may be more vulnerable. With our five to 11 year olds, we now have 31% of them have gotten that first dose and we've got a few more percent booked in to get the dose. Still a lot of five to 11 year olds who have not yet been vaccinated or got their dose. So really would encourage that we try and make sure we get them a dose before the holiday season so we can keep them protected. You know, we've had really great feedback across our you know, public health clinics with a lot of parents sharing their really positive stories of how their children have gone through their vaccination, which has been really good to see. Of course, we're now pivoting to try and also deliver booster doses. And I just want to highlight the, you know, pretty large tasks we have ahead of us with vaccination and booster doses. And so these are the various different age groups and how large those populations are. This is a number of people who are going to currently need booster doses across those age groups. So it's quite a substantial number of people. And I think there's been a lot of you know, news lately of people struggling to get a booster dose appointment. And that's simply just because there's such a large number of people who are you know, rightly seeking out a booster dose. And unfortunately, there are not enough appointments available to do everybody in a short period of time. And I'm hoping what we can do is make sure we let the eldest amongst us who are most likely to become severely ill get their booster doses before perhaps some of us who are younger go and get our booster doses so we can make sure the people who most need that protection get it. Of course, we still want to get more people with their first and second doses because that vaccine is going to be really important to protect them. And so there's quite a substantial number of doses we still want to be administering in the coming months here in Niagara. Uh, just quickly showing you what the uptake on vaccination has been. The orange line was first doses, the blue lines are second doses. And just adding here our green lines here for booster doses, you can see we're making good progress getting the people at highest risk with their booster dose. Obviously still more to do and over the next few weeks, hopefully we'll get a lot of these people protected with that booster dose as well. And you know, you can see you know, just how much we've been increasing our capacity lately. You know, if you look over the last several months, we've been sort of between 1,000, you know, 2,000 doses a day, actually dropping below 1,000 doses for a bit. And you can see over the last couple of weeks, we've really been ramping up to get more booster doses out to people. And over the last couple of days, actually been just under 4,000. This is actually yesterday's data. I haven't added in today's, uh, the data we released today, but that again was around 4,000 doses. Uh, and so we're really hoping we'll be able to get more booster doses out as we ramp up our capacity. And, our hope is to actually keep increasing this over the next few days to get to even higher numbers. There are some barriers though, though we do have with vaccinating right now compared to the spring. You know, we don't necessarily have access to all the large sites because a lot of them are sporting centers and they're back catering to the public with those sports. We've sadly had a lot of attrition of healthcare workers over the course of the pandemic due to burnout, uh, due to the real intensity of work people have had to do. And so we don't have quite the number of healthcare workers that we did 
previously as well. Hospitals are really busy right now. So a lot of healthcare workers have left public health to really do patient care again. We fortunately were, had low case numbers back in the spring and early summer, which means fewer of our staff were actually getting sick. So we had more staff available to work in clinics. We were doing less contact tracing. So we had more people able to do vaccinations. We had fewer outbreaks and more people able to do vaccinations. These are, of course, more of a challenge for us right now, which does limit the ability to as much vaccinations. Schools were closed, so we weren't doing any work to try and keep them open. That is a lot of work. And of course, that ties down staff who would otherwise be vaccinating. Because it's summertime, uh, we tend to see fewer illnesses then. So we are seeing our hospitals more busy right now. So they are less able to vaccinate right now. Summertime also meant that nursing students, you know, other health professional students were on summer break and able to vaccinate. That's a little bit more challenging to get them to vaccinate right now, given that there is, uh, you know, studies for them to do right now. And of course, we were in a lockdown for a lot of the spring going into the summer, which meant actually fewer people were out and about, which means fewer people were getting sick and injured. That meant the hospitals were less busy. When we were doing contact tracing, people really weren't around other people. So that really lightened our contact tracing work again. And so I do think we're gonna to struggle to get up to quite the same numbers of vaccine delivery that we were seeing back in the spring and early summer, given all of these barriers. That being said, we're doing our best to try and address them. We're trying to secure some larger sites so we can deliver vaccines more efficiently. We're finding every single person we can to be able to vaccinate and run our clinics. So I'm very much hoping that we're going to see those numbers go up. But just given we need to do, you know, over 300,000 booster doses, even if we get up to six, seven, eight thousand doses a day, it's still unfortunately going to be a weeks long process to vaccinate people. And this is really what we're seeing across the province. You know, a couple of headlines from London and Ottawa about how they're also similar to us struggling to meet just the huge demand of people who rightly want to get booster doses but the capacity unfortunately just isn't there to quite deliver at that size. So I think, you know, the, the key thing for us to think going forward here, and I think the science table really summarizes this as well, is while the Omicron variant transmits very quickly, the vaccines are perhaps a little less effective, they're still very good at protecting severe illness. And if we get booster doses out to those most vulnerable children, elderly people, that's going to make a big difference in blunting the severeness from this wave. I think, sadly, we will need some capacity limits and social restrictions as well to help slow down the spread and blunt this wave. And if we all then practice those behaviors that we've done at other points in this pandemic to limit our social contacts, to wear masks really well, keep distance, all of that together will hopefully keep our cases from rising as quickly as they otherwise would we'll preserve hospital capacity, we'll use our new medications we have to treat people who get COVID-19, and we'll slowly get boosted doses so that we can once again have that vaccine to prevent us. So I really do think that we benefit from seeing how bad Omicron variant has been in other countries. And so we're able to learn from their experience and we have a little bit more time to prepare because we have that head start of seeing what they've done. And we haven't let our cases get as far out of control as other countries did. So that's bought us a couple more weeks to repair. And I think if we use those couple weeks really well, I think we can escape the worst of this variant. And I think there definitely is still some hope for us. And so I'll stop there and hand it back over to questions and just throw up a few more examples here of some kids who got vaccinated. Okay. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Hurd. We really always appreciate you actually really addressing a lot of the questions that have come forward over the last week, especially the last couple of uh, days uh, from the audience. I'm looking at the chat and some of the things that are also being texted from us, uh, texted to us. And there does seem to be a question about how can I make an appointment? Maybe some of the sites are not available yet, but people A, can't make an appointment for their elderly, uh, for elderly people um, or for loved ones that they have. And that in itself might give people peace of mind too, if that is in place. And then again, uh, because in the past, and maybe with the urgency that we heard from the Ontario government, we are looking at vaccination clinics and is that being explored? Can you give us a little bit of uh, a sense of what to expect um, so that people, yes. just to alleviate the stress that this uncertainty gives people again? Yeah, absolutely. And we, we totally understand people are struggling to get appointments. As I noted, we have you know over 300,000 people who are you know, going to be seeking booster doses. And you, that unfortunately is a weeks long process. 
we have released lots of appointments through the months of December, and we've actually ramped up our clinics to as large as we can. And we're still actually tweaking them a little bit to add some more appointments. Unfortunately, just with so many people uh, eligible to book appointments, those appointments have all actually filled up. We are hopefully actually probably even by the end of today, definitely by this weekend, gonna be releasing a whole bunch of additional appointments for the end of December and into January. We are actually just finalizing contracts with additional sites, which are gonna allow us to run bigger clinics. So people who haven't been able to get an appointment, I really encourage them to check back later today and then over the weekend, because there's gonna be lots more sites available to get vaccinated. One of the differences here is that we haven't released January appointments, which is where our a lot of our other regions are actually booking their appointments right now. And we didn't because we were trying to make sure we solidify these additional sites where you could run bigger clinics. So when we put the appointments up, people could actually book into those clinics rather than having only a smaller number available and then changing the location on people and having to contact them with that. Okay. Thank you for that clarification because we also hear from a lot of people that are actually saying we're going out of town. We're going mm -hmm. to these places and other places because they can confirm one. So maybe we're asking them to basically hold off for another 48 hours before doing so yeah um, and then for those people who've made an appointment elsewhere you know definitely do check back the, uh, later today this evening and you'll hopefully be able to reschedule your appointment to something a bit earlier and closer to home okay that sounds good thank you um there are we assume that there are enough booster shots available so there's no limitation there on that end of it but when it comes to rapid uh, antigen tests or so something that we have become significantly louder on we at the chamber have distributed them to businesses small and medium-sized businesses for the last six months the uptake has been incredible uh, but mm -hmm. again this is only to keep workplaces uh, safe this is not for personal use as much uh, that's uh, that we have and make them available and we'll make sure to actually include a link to our site in our chat as well but two million for ontario in uh, antigen testing um, testing kits seems not like a very high number in light of how often or frequently people should possibly getting tested um, what are your thoughts on this one where they're available uh, in niagara and how can we ensure that more people are more regularly are testing themselves yeah yeah you know, I think 2 million is obviously not enough for a population of 4.6 million, where hopefully people are not going to just test themselves one time, they'll be testing themselves multiple times. So I do think hopefully the province will be able to secure more tests to distribute. They're rolling out distribution of them at some large public places like malls and the like. Unfortunately, the list they have right now doesn't include anywhere in Niagara. They'll also be distributed select LCBOs. And unfortunately, I haven't seen a list of which LCBOs, but I imagine some will hopefully be Niagara LCBOs. So if you check it with the LCBOs, you may find out which one is going to be distributing and be able to pick up some free kits there. And there's, of course, if you're willing to pay the option to also buy it from several pharmacies as well. Yeah. Um, we are going to add to the chat, we are aware of that there's two LCBOs Great. in Catherine's actually that are uh, making these kits available to individuals, so we are making sure to share them with everyone too. And also on an ongoing basis on our website and through our social media channels, we'll make people aware of where they can go, especially before we have the holiday gatherings that are there. We are talking about uh, additional measures. Give us your take on has, have we gone far enough or are we going to see that either the province or Niagara is going to impose stricter measures to keep people safe? And this is always something that has been critically important to businesses because these measures impact them and their staff uh, and their operations significantly. Yeah, I, I think we can expect that. And I'll share that if we don't see the province acting on that, I think I will be going ahead and doing that myself. What we're gonna talk about is not actually closing businesses. I think we'll be talking about capacity limits on the location. So places where there's lots of people who may come into a location, reducing that on the order of maybe 50%. Um, also perhaps some expansion on proof of vaccination requirements. I think those are the kinds of measures that we will see not going into an all-out lockdown or having places closed. Okay. 
if I can only say that when we do give businesses a bit of time, yeah. I think we need to be prepared. Uh, it's significant impact on it. And where it sometimes helps us if we move forward as a country on some of those measures mm -hmm. or as a province, it is that they are being offset with other things that actually really take into consideration that we're now cutting people's income and yeah. earnings in half. And those need to be offset by equal measures on the other hand to support them. So whenever both announcements can be made at the same time, it alleviates it's a significant amount of stress uh, that is there. But I'm going to go into a couple of specific questions that I either have come in through the chat or via email. And one of them is uh, about people that are double vaccinated. Do they still need to run through these rapid tests? Should they get some testing kits at workplaces and others? Or can we assume uh, that maybe they are less necessary for them? You know, I think the rapid tests were not so necessary for someone who is fully vaccinated because being fully vaccinated really reduced your risk of being infected with COVID-19. With the Omicron variant, as I showed, that protection has gone from, you know, being about 87% to down to 33%. So I think the argument to use rapid tests, even if you're fully vaccinated, is a lot stronger now. And so, you know, if people want to, you know, be as safe as possible, I certainly would still encourage that. You know, just given we don't have enough rapid tests, I would discourage maybe using a rapid test every day. It seems like the optimal is to use it about two times a week, and you get an over 90% of the benefit if you're using it two times a week as compared to, you know, using it every single day. And so I'd say that's probably the right frequency to use it and use it around the times, you know, where you think the risk is going to be greatest and you want to make the greatest certainty that someone isn't going to be infected with COVID-19. Perfect. Um, this is a question that has come forward uh, from Ken, and they're asking, would you consider a Christmas Eve worship service of less than 100 people? To, is that too much of a risk, or is it uh, something that is safe to attend? You know, it's hard to say just based on that number, because so much depends also on the surrounding context. If you're in, say, a hall that can hold 1,000 people, and you have 100 people there, and they're all going to be spaced out, of course, that's going to be a lot safer than, say, a hall that can normal capacity is 100 and you have 100 people there, which means they're going to be a lot closer together. So what I'd really say is you want to avoid any kinds of crowds, any kind of density of people. You want to really make sure you have physical distance separating you from other people, that you're wearing a mask, and ideally be in a space where there's going to be good ventilation. All right. Um, I wanted to follow up on my, my comment that there are two LCBOs in St. Catharines that have the testing kits. We just had one of our attendees calling those locations and they're out of them by now. So they had them, but uh, because of the limited number of uh, antigen testing kits that are available, they ran out quite quickly. So I just wanted to let our audience know. This is a question, again, we are looking at considering uh, gatherings over the holidays. Um, and this particular question is coming forward from Lori. And uh, they're asking if someone tests positive for COVID, um, will public health require everyone who has been in that room unmasked to quarantine for a period of time or get a negative test result? And so here's again, we're hearing from more people being infected and people are wondering what, what, what is my responsibility at this point? How am I supposed to move forward? And where do I go for those tests at the same time? Yeah, so... It would depend a little bit on the timing, but assuming a person tested positive within a couple of days of that gathering, yeah, everybody who is at that gathering would need to isolate for a period of time. And we'd recommend about five to seven days out, you would get a test to check if you got infected with COVID-19 and maybe had asymptomatic infection without symptoms. So that would be the recommendation going forward. Testing for now will still be available through the assessment centers run by Niagara Health. But pharmacies are increasingly actually offering testing as well, including some take-home kits where you can actually take home the kit, swab yourself, drop the kit back off at the pharmacy. Perfect. Excellent. Um, this is coming to your point that you made of how difficult it will be to staff vaccine uh, site, mm -hmm. mass vaccination sites. And I can imagine that, that hurdle because we're hearing from so many other employers having such difficulty yeah. actually staffing and therefore not being able to go to full uh, capacity. There is uh, one of our participants today as mm -hmm. asking, could you regular could regular civilians be recruited to give the vaccine? Uh, there's individuals who have some training in it, um, but is there somewhere where maybe volunteers could help in some capacity to assist you and your team in moving forward? Yeah, we definitely would love to get some volunteers who are interested in helping out. 
Uh, I believe our e the email address is phvolunteers at niagararegion.ca. And if you send an email there, we'll make sure you're added to our list and call upon you to see how you can help. Alternately, if you just go onto the niagararegion.ca website, go to the contact form, you can just submit a message there and it'll get to us. Perfect. You talked about different measures that people can take. So mask requirements are still in place mm -hmm. and are being greatly encouraged. Uh, we are being asked if there's a high quality mask, if there's a difference between a surgical level of two or three, and if one needs to be considered more than the other. Yeah, so uh, there is a difference between level two, level three. For our purposes, it doesn't matter. If you're using either of those, it's going to be equivalently good for protecting you from COVID-19. When I, we talk about high quality masks, I think the most important element of a mask is that you need to have it fit well around your face. So, you know, a lot of people have these masks that are kind of falling down, they won't stay up. That's not a good quality mask. If you have gaps in your mask or big spaces, that means that if you're infected with COVID-19, you're gonna breathe it out, it's gonna escape into the air so other people get infected. If you are around other people, that air can get in and you're gonna breathe it in and you're gonna breathe in the virus. So the key thing is to have a well-fitting mask ideally a mask that is multiple layers. Um, if you buy a medical mask, that's great because that's already gonna pretty much make sure you have it. Just make sure you kind of mold it around your nose to make sure you get a good seal there. And then if you wanna go for the ultimate mask, you can get an N95 or KN95 mask. That's gonna make sure you have a good seal. It's gonna have a good filter, a little bit more expensive, but absolutely encourage people if they wanna get the best protection, that's what will give you the best protection. Perfect. Um, we have a question specifically related to hockey organizations and arenas. And uh, their question is, can the 50-minute admission be re-evaluated for hockey arenas um, as uh, OMHA has made vaccinations mandatory for all players and volunteers and 50 minutes is a safety and health issue with waiting in line to get in. Uh, some of them are also um, concerned that these kids have all of the equipment with them in some cases, no winter protection that is there, and uh, it leaves them a little bit more exposed. But um, maybe this question also, I have to admit, came forward about a week ago, and I think we are our minds and uh, focus is slightly shifting. But I think it's still good to look at what is in place and do we need to keep it in place? Yeah, you know, very quickly, I'll mention, you know, we have seen outbreaks even amongst fully vaccinated sports teams. Uh, and with the Omicron variant, sadly, that's increasing a lot. I heard from our colleagues in Waterloo that just, you know, over this past weekend, they had 15 new outbreaks amongst sports teams occurring. So it's definitely a high risk area, even sadly, with full vaccination. And so we do think we need to be cautious there. In terms of the 15 minute rule, definitely we're you know, open to reevaluating it. We want to see how it works in practice. There is some flexibility around that. You know, the intention is not that people get thrown out of the building into the cold, you know, when 15 minutes are up. We do expect to, you know, be somewhat reasonable here. The key thing we're going for is that we don't want people loitering around before or after their game. Uh, if you're, you know, spacing people out, giving them terms to use a change room, of course, you can have a little bit of a waiting lag there you know, want to try and work with people to make this work. And so that's our hope, first open. If we see it's not working, of course, we'll reevaluate it. And we certainly welcome any feedback. Okay. There, you had mentioned in your presentation an additional medication that has come forward, and I think it's from Pfizer uh, in form of mm -hmm. pills that is that are available. Are those ones ones that are available to the population the prescri prescriptions, I assume, are needed or are they only being administered in uh, hospitals and settings where they're being used. Uh, people are asking about it because yeah. I think a lot of question, people have questions about the booster shot, um, if that's an option or if there may be other options available to them. Yeah, so those pills aren't quite yet licensed by Health Canada, so they're not really very available. My hope is that they're going to be very quickly approved on kind of a fast track, given that we have a lot of need for them. I know in the UK, for example, they're already approved and starting to be used. Once they're out, I think they will be prescription-based likely. So, you know, a primary care provider could prescribe them, hospitals could prescribe them. That's probably going to be the avenue we get them. Yeah, excellent. And I think it's good for people to know of what actually it might look like moving forward. <laughs> We have talked over the last couple of months about all the different different variants and the impact that they've had. We talked Alpha, we talked Delta, we talked this one today that we have. 
And when you're looking at the next uh, three months, then we are looking at the next six months or looking into 2022, now the third year of the pandemic that we're finding ourselves in. Are we expecting more variants to come forward? Is this an ongoing forward moving situation that we're dealing with? Um, and I think it's again a question that people have in light of the vaccinations as to saying like, are we having the right vaccine? Then we hear some pharmaceutical companies talking about having adjusted some of their uh, or planning to adjust some of their vaccines. What are people needing to look for? Yeah, it's a little bit looking into the crystal ball here. I would say our track record of the past year has shown that variants will emerge. So I think that's definitely a risk going forward. Key thing is variants seem to emerge and because when you have an area where COVID-19 isn't controlled. If it's not controlled, every time it spreads in someone, it's multiplying, you're gonna get mutations. And sometimes you end up with a mutation that gives the virus a survival advantage and that becomes a variant that starts to spread. And so if you minimize the number of cases, minimize the amount of spread that's occurring, you minimize the chance of those mutations and the chance that you're gonna have one of those variants emerge. You know, I think for the next little while, we're unfortunately going to need to really focus inwards again to make sure that we keep ourselves safe because, again, we're facing real threat here. But I think we then need to make sure we pivot and make sure we get the rest of the world protected from COVID-19 with vaccines, with help dealing with their spread. Because once we actually get COVID controlled across the world, I think our chance of seeing these variants is going to start to go down a lot. As long as we have this, you know, um, division in the world where some parts of the world have lots of vaccine, have got it under control, and other parts are still seeing it spread uncontrollably, we're going to unfortunately keep seeing variants emerge. And we need to make sure we address that because I think our safety isn't just what happens in our borders, it's really what happens globally. Yeah. <clears throat> that sounds good. We heard over the last two days, I think today Brock University, yesterday Naga College announced that they're making some adjustments to their in-class participation, looking at the new term that is starting out. We heard the same this week that Eden had closed on earlier uh, than the school year to make, see some movement again. Are we seeing more or anticipating more of that throughout January? I think we're probably going to have to rethink a little bit about how we operate definitely as we get into January because we are expecting to see much higher case numbers than I think we have been used to. And there's going to be a lot more risk of COVID-19 going around. You know, I talked about you know capacity limits are probably going to be one of the things that we're going to need to help slow down the virus. That probably is going to impact how schools operate as well and how universities operate. And so I, I don't know exactly what that looks like. I think over the next few weeks, we're going to have to be thinking through that to figure out when schools and universities reopen, what they look like. But across society, I think a goal is going to be for the next couple of months, at least, to reduce the number of close contacts we have with others to really deprive as much opportunity as possible for the virus to spread. And this probably leads directly in a question from one of our attendees. Are we recommending to people in our office to start working from home again or to work remotely? And I think it's something that the Ontario government has spoken to. And I see you nodding. Yeah, if people are able to work remotely, absolutely, let's have them work remotely. That's going to make sure they stay safe, that they're going to be healthy and able to keep, you know, doing the work of your business. It's going to slow down the spread in our community overall. I think that's a really good practice if we're able to have that done. All right. There's another question that has come in, and there's the perception that more people are getting COVID uh, that are vaccinated than unvaccinated. And I was wondering if you can speak to that. Is that the case? Do the facts support it, or um, what is, um, or is that a myth? It's not entirely untrue. It's I wouldn't say there's more people vaccinated getting sick than unvaccinated. It's about 50-50, pretty much. But it's important to remember that you have the 76% of people who are fully vaccinated, uh, making up half our cases, and then that small minority who are the 24% who are not yet fully vaccinated, making up the other half. So right from there, the risk is at least three to four times higher if you are unvaccinated, because a smaller percentage of people leading to the same number of cases as a much larger group who is vaccinated. Okay. A couple of questions have come back to us and you had indicated um, that maybe you are going to plan to put some measures in mm -hmm. place and uh, 
uh, there are a few attendees are asking if you can expand on it to saying which sectors are you looking at, knowing that you haven't confirmed it yet. Uh, yeah. But just in an effort to being prepared as we're all going into the holidays, some areas and offices and organizations are going to be short staffed during that period of time and then having to com come back to possibly different realities. And so they're wondering if uh, um, if you could expand yeah. on that. I can definitely share the kinds of areas we're thinking about. You know, I'll say our hope is that the province acts because the Omicron variant is not a local issue. It is a provincial issue. We need rules across the province and it would make the most sense that we have consistent rule across the province rather than 34 different rules set by every local public health agency. Uh, and then to the extent if the province doesn't act and we act alone, we are consulting with our neighboring health units to hopefully at least have some regional coordination to get consistency. Kinds of places we're looking at are the places where you're going to see people really congregating together. So meeting event spaces, grocery, restaurants, bars, food, drink establishments, uh, sports, recreational facilities, concert venues, theaters, cinemas, attractions like movies, uh, museums, sorry, galleries, that kind of thing, casinos, bingo halls, gaming, perhaps less of a concern right now, but fairs, rural exhibitions, festivals, even places like personal care services, hair and nail salon, tattoo salons, less congregating there, but definitely, you know, there's very close interaction between the provider and the clients there. Goal again is not to close any of these places, but it will be probably to reduce the capacity down to 50%. So we can have more physical distance between people and we can reduce the amount of spread of infection that occurs. Mm -hmm. Can we ask you um, that mm -hmm. if you're looking at it, you're saying you're consulting with your colleagues in other health yeah. regions across, is there a sense that the Ontario government will put this forward or is there a sense that actually it has to be driven by individual health units? And the reason people are asking is that when the government puts it forward, there's often that secondary aspect of it, mm -hmm. understanding here are the other ways that we're supporting you moving forward. Yeah. And they have seen it and rent subsidies, wage subsidies, loan that are available to those vulnerable ones because this these decisions are significant mm -hmm. because when you look they're significant to any business and so that's the question that has come forward are we looking yeah, at no, it I, I, I 100% understand and you know th this is partly why we don't want to go down the road of a lockdown because we know how devastating that would be after you know some yeah. very difficult 21 months our real hope is that the province will act and we are messaging to the province that we are going to act locally if they don't to hopefully give them some pressure to hopefully act so it's done in a coordinated way by the province and that we get those additional supports that you've talked about. Um, you know, we had hoped that this would happen earlier in the week by the province. You know, the science table briefed the province earlier in the week than we heard it publicly and that didn't seem to unfortunately motivate them to really put those measures in place. So we're not really sure what's going to happen going forward. And so hence why we are talking locally that we feel we might need to act. Certainly hope it is a province that acts and does give you all those additional supports that I think are very much warranted. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it does make a, a significant difference to business. Yeah. It's already difficult to deal with, um, but it needs to be a balanced approach of it. I'm conscious of the time, but I'm also conscious that at the same time, um, we are a border community. We are, um, we are looking at the travel restrictions that are there. Do you want to speak to that point as well in elements that maybe we need to do, we can do to ensure the, the health and safety of our community? Yeah, you know, what I'd say is that we look at the US, they have done a much worse job controlling COVID-19, cases are far higher there, and I think they don't have a good handle even of what is spreading there, and they probably have a lot of the Omicron variant spreading there. We, you know, travel around the world, I showed you countries, Norway, Denmark, South Africa, much higher rates of the Omicron variant than us, the UK similar. I really think that we are going to be probably better placed in most countries going into this wave. And if we travel elsewhere, we are putting ourselves at risk of the Omicron variant. So any non-essential travel we would really recommend people don't partake in. Crossing the border to do shopping, you know, that's not the kind of thing that I think makes a lot of sense right now, just given all of the risk. I understand some people do have to work across the border. Some people work in really critical industries across the border. Of course, we're not telling people to forego their income, but make sure when you do cross the border, you take every precaution. Wear your mask, unlike perhaps what maybe other people around there are doing. Keep your physical distance um, and make sure you really just go to work and come straight home. Don't go shopping, do some of those other things that are gonna be higher risk. Perfect. 
Well, um, this is uh, the last espresso for this year that we're going to have with you. We just wanted to express our like sincerest thank you actually for your time and then otherwise probably wild and crazy days that you're having uh, at this this time and uh, we hope to continue them in light of the um the rapid changes that we're all going through into the new year as well so we really do appreciate it um i encourage everyone if you are looking for updates that are there we will share through our chat uh, the niagara public health website that has the latest updates that are there our gncc website as well is trying to link you to any access to any services that you need um, as well as we will make sure that through all of our social media channels that we are trying to keep the public updated on what it looks like in the upcoming days as we're moving forward. So Dr. Herji, thank you from all of us, my colleagues, our board, our members in the community, our business community for the time that you have given us. It is deeply appreciated. Um, and to each and every one of you who have actually has joined us today, we wish you a joyous holiday season and especially a very safe one. Thank you. Thank you.